Right, it's been a long time since I've done a recording. So, my name's Steve, it was Derek yesterday, and I'm going to do a talk on exposure factors and introducing you to um, the thing, the considerations that we make when exposing somebody to radiation. We don't just blast them willy-nilly, unlike some American presidents. And that's what we're going to talk about. What, how do we determine exposure factors? is basically what I'm going to talk about. So we're going to get you to do a group exercise. If you're watching at home on YouTube, then you might not be able to do the group exercise, but you'll still be able to do the exercise that I'm going to set you to do, not going to the gym necessarily. Then we're going to look at kilovoltage potential, the MAS or the mass, as Americans say, the SDD and the inverse square law, although that should be SID, but not SID from Ice Age. And then I'm going to give you a strategy for adjusting exposure factors. And hopefully by the end of it, you're going to be able to list all of the exposure factors. Or I'm going to give you a strategy for being able to remember all of the exposure factors at your clinical placement site. So I want you to list a bunch of exposure factors for the following body parts. Now, it doesn't really matter if you don't know what the exposure factors are. Um, I want you to just make some considerations about it. The reason it doesn't matter is because we're going to go through and show you how these affect our images um, and how you are going to determine the exposure factors and a rough guidance on how you would determine them. So I want people watching at home uh, can pause the video. I'm going to cut when, once we've paused it and done the exercise. So I would like you to list all the exposure factors or what you think might be reasonable exposure factors in terms of KVP and MAS for a cervical spine, AP and lateral, AP thoracic spine, a PA chest, an AP and lateral lumbar spine, AP pelvis, horizontal beam hip, an AP and lateral knee, foot, ankle, hand, wrist and elbow. Now, welcome back, people watching online. So what considerations do we have to... What considerations do we have to make as radiographers when we're determining exposure factors? So what do we mean by an exposure? Basically, the exposure factors that we're setting, we're determining an exposure. An exposure is basically how long the patient and or an image receptor is exposed to radiation. There's not really anything too exciting about it. An exposure is basically how many X-ray photons are going to strike the receptor. And one of the problems of, or one of the obstructions of those, to those photons is the patient or the body part that you're X-raying. So I set you that group exercise about considerations to exposure factors. So have a little think about that and we'll come back. So what do you think influences exposure factors? Many things. Long story short. So we have things that we don't have control of and things that we do have control of. The ones on the um, left-hand most part of the screen are things that we don't have control over. We don't have control of the requested body part. In some respects, as a senior radiographer, I have control over the appropriateness of certain body parts. Um, and the requested examinations, if I think that the examination is inappropriate, I can sometimes within my professional autonomy change the examination to what I deem is appropriate based on how the patient is presenting to me. Age of the patient is a very important consideration in terms of exposure factor. The younger a person is, their body is, their cells in their body are rapidly dividing and so rapidly dividing cells are more susceptible to ionizing radiation and changes and mutations in DNA. And so if I was x-raying a child versus 96-year-old Doris or 86-year-old Doris that's obese, am I going to give the same exposure factors to a 12-year-old when uh, we're x-raying? Let's say we're x-raying their abdomen. Would I give the same exposure factors? I'm not going to tell you what exposure factors I would give, but do you know what exposure, you know, would you give the same? That is the question. So we've got 
the patient habitus that I've elaborated on there a little bit. This can be a problem with um, obesity, particularly um, for radiographers in terms of setting exposure factors. And we can't tell that until somebody gets in the room. We can set a preliminary exposure, but we can't tell exactly what we're going to give them until we see them. Then we we'll say about density and thickness. So thickness is how thick a body part is. That's basically what it is. But thickness and density aren't the same. You can have something that's really thick, but that actually isn't dense. You could have a, um, a room full of air. It's not very dense. But if that room was full of lead, it's a little bit more dense. And that's what we mean about the difference between density. So air density is completely different to water density, and it's completely different to bone density and or um, metal. It all relates to the atomic number of the actual part that we're imaging. And basically, there are many, 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 many things that ex affect exposure factor, can, um, what exposure factors we're going to give. But all we're trying to do as radiographers is think about the things that we don't have control over and then adjust the things that we do have control over. So we might not have it. Um, control over the body part, the request of the examination, the age of the patient, the pregnancy status of the patient. Um, I might exclude that. I wouldn't consider that too much. Um, but that means applying lead to them. Thickness and density. These are all things that we don't have inherent control over. But we know what they are when we see the patient. And we know what they are based on our knowledge of anatomy. And so... Taking into consideration all the things on the left-hand side, we're able to adjust the energy of rays. Now, what we mean by energy of rays is the kilovoltage potential. A little bit of a picture of Tesla there. Can anyone tell me what KVP means? Kilovoltage potential. What, 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 what does it mean? What does it mean in terms of an X-ray tube? Come on. KVP is basically the intensity of the beam. Now, an analogy that I've heard an engineer um, say is that the KVP is the speed of the bullet or the speed of your X-rays, uh, the speed of the electrons passing across the glass envelope. Although that's not entirely accurate, it more relates to the ability of the X-ray photons to penetrate a medium. And as they penetrate or pass through a medium, they become attenuated. And so, attenuate, by attenuate, what we mean by attenuation is that they're trying to pass through. And as they pass through, they deposit energy into a patient, into a person. And... Whether or not they pass out of a patient depends on if they have the appropriate energy to pass out of them. And so as rays pass through, they're attenuated, and so they selectively block areas of radiation on an image, and that's what produces your image, basically, the line focus principle. If you've got a very dense object, like lead, it's got a high atomic number, it's going to stop those photons passing through, you're getting a white image because what you're seeing is an absence of rays in that area. But I digress. So the intensity of an X-ray beam is basically what kilovoltage potential is. It's the penetrating power of the photons that you have. It affects the quality of the beam and produces contrast. And contrast is the variance between the main radiographic densities of air, soft tissue, bone, and water. And... Ideally, depending on what examination you're undertaking or performing, you want to have the optimal kilovoltage potential to allow those photons to penetrate a medium. And so we're going to look at a picture highlighting that, these very, very wibbly-wobbly lines. So low-energy X-rays, about 60 kV, is the lowest you'll use in diagnostics. The others are far, far too soft low energy. They're filtered out using aluminium, about 1.5 millimetres or 1 millimetre of aluminium or um, beryllium. And as you can see there, that they're not very energetic. They're a bit sluggish, a bit like me in the morning. 
They're not going to get out of that patient. I'm going to guess that that's an abdomen. Although I can see a bit of what looks like sternum. So we'll just guess at a chest. So you've got low energy KVP. And so most of the X-ray photons is that you see from there are absorbed. They're not going to get through. They're absorbed by the patient. They're attenuated. And very few emerge to strike the image receptor, as it says there. And conversely, if you give very high energy X-rays, they're going to pass through the patient and penetrate the body part and not be attenuated as much. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of ridiculously low KV and ridiculously high KV. Or low KV and high KV. So based on the principle that I was saying about that low energy photons don't have the sufficient energy to pass through the body properly. And so what are you what's going to happen if you even though I've already told you the answer, here's a real world example. If you take a chest x-ray at 50 kV and 4 MAS, you can get exactly what you're seeing in the left-hand image, which is a PA chest x-ray. Actually, I can't say that for certain because it's not labelled. It just says erect. Um, we'll assume it's PA. So we've done it at 50 kV and 2 M or 1 MAS. Let's go ridiculous. What, what can you tell me about that image? I'm trying to get you to think about how it impacts an image. And I may try and include some more images or draw some fancy diagrams. But what you're looking at there is it's underpenetrated. How do we know it's underpenetrated? How do we know? We're not just having one. So the left hand image is severely underpenetrated. And that means, as I was saying earlier, I'm trying to reinforce the idea that these photons have a given amount of energy and increasing that kilo voltage potential increases the average number uh, the average energy the average energy of the um, generated rays of the bremsstrahlung spectrum it increases that number it increases sorry the, the maximum energy of the x-rays generated during that exposure so very low energy x-rays aren't going to penetrate so what you're seeing here is that You've got two lungs and a heart, and but you can't really see what's going on behind the heart. You can see that there's air in the lungs, that's about it, but you can't really see much else. You, you can't see behind the heart, you can't see the, the spine, you can't really see lung markings either. And you can see that the bone is very, very bright. Now, why is the bone bright? Why is the heart bright? Why is the heart white? Because it's underpenetrated. That is because, again, those rays aren't energetic enough to get through. That's basically all it is. They're not, they're not going fast enough. That is a very, very, very poor example. I should never say that. They've not got the energy to get through. They've not got the energy to get out of bed like me in the morning. On the opposite side is an adequately penetrated and adequately exposed chest X-ray. Why is it an adequately exposed chest X-ray? Think about me saying the energy of photons. And so we say that the KVP produces contrast and affects the photon's ability to penetrate a medium. As you can see on this chest X-ray, we've got plenty of contrast. Why do we see plenty of contrast? Well, we can see the differentiation between air, bone, soft tissue. Why do we know that? Because we can see the chest border, we can see the soft tissue around the shoulders, we can also see the ribs, we can see lung markings, these little sort of speckly bits um, around here. You can, you can see lung markings, you can see the hilum, you can see the trachea, you can't really see the trachea, left and right main bronchus. You cannot see those quite nicely. On the opposite image, on the right hand side image, but you can't see them on the right-hand side image. At left-hand side image, you can't see them all. Again, another example. 
This one's a little bit harder to see. This is back. This is sort of CR days, and also kind of Lordotic. A little bit too much angled down on these images. So image A, again, is underpenetrated. Why? Because we can't see through the heart. So there's an ad inadequate KV been given. Now with with CR and with DR now, you the software will do its best to pull back whatever it can from from what from what little data it's got really. What we're trying to do as radiographers essentially is achieve a good signal to noise ratio without cooking a patient. Signal to noise ratio because these interactions with photons inside a body when an x-ray hits something, it interacts with... You're not going to really be able to predict how they're going to interact. with mass. Well, actually we can. We know that they'll scatter. Some of them will be attenuated and transmitted, and others will be absorbed completely, or attenuated. So we can predict what's going to happen, but each of the individual atoms that that happens within, we cannot predict. And how the x-rays are produced from the tube, we can't predict their interactions with individual atoms. We know what will happen, an overview picture of what will happen, but we cannot predict the individual patterns. And so we need to achieve enough rays that the computer is able to differentiate between random noise and x-rays. That's basically what we're trying to do. And if it's underpenetrated, then you're going to get more noise because it's having to try and figure out what's there when there isn't anything there because no rays have hit the plate. So image A, I digressed. Image A is underpenetrated. We can't see through the heart. We can't see the trachea. We can't see the left and the right main bronchus differentiation. We can still see lung markings, only just. On the chest X-ray, how do we know that that's adequately penetrated? Well, we can see lung markings, although I would argue that actually we may have given a bit too much KV because we've lost the lung markings in the upper portion of the chest. That may just be a poor reproduction of a Google image. So we're missing detail. We've got too much detail on the other side. We've got very, very good lung markings. On the other side, we've not got as many lung markings. But we can see the trachea. We can see, oh, classic, farting around with the uh, clicker. But we can see a lot more on the other side. Now, think, just thinking about the considerations to radiation dose, in terms of skin dose, what's going to happen if we give somebody 50 kV and 1 ms for a chest X ray? Go back to the original image on the left. What what potential impact does that have on dose to the patient in terms of skin dose? And also general overall dose. There's going to be more X-ray photons absorbed, and so you're increasing the likelihood of an ionization occurring because we're using ionizing radiation, and that just means that it has the ability to knock an electron out of a shell causing a change in the overall charge of an atom. That's all it means. So we're going to move on to current, MA. It's not a fruit. It's a measure of the number of electrons. And so the current kind of can be thought of as the number of rays, all about them rays, about them rays. No KV. And it's the current applied to the filament. If you're not familiar with how X-rays are generated, you have a little filament. Heat that filament up so it gets really, really hot. Pass a current across that filament. A current is a flow of electric charge. Those photons es escape off of that. They boil off. Don't think of it as a boiling kettle. It's nothing like that. And the electrons float freely in space inside this vacuum, the vacuum envelope, the glass envelope inside your X-ray machine. And then when you use the kilovoltage potential to drag them across, it sounds like it's like me being dragged out of bed in the morning, um, they're accelerated across a vacuum at one-tenth the speed of light. And then when they smack into a tungsten target, they interact either as Bremsstrahlung, creating Bremsstrahlung spectrum of radiation, 
and or the characteristic K shell, um, K lines. Probably doesn't mean much to you, but the current is directly proportional to the number of X-rays generated. You double the current, double the number of rays produced. That's all that that means. Again, this is kind of along the lines of sort of photographic stuff. And thinking about that, so we've got current and we've got killer voltage. So killer voltage affects how energetic that X-ray beam will be for that split second. And the current, which is the electric charge um, applied to uh, electrical current applied to a coil of wire inside a um, cobalt. I think it might be cobalt or it could be t um, titanium. Not sure. It may be co cobalt or see some sort of element. Doesn't really matter. And they use something to focus it to give you fine and broad focus. So one of them is wider than the other, one of them is smaller than the other. And that's all it does. So increasing the current, what do we do? Increases the number of rays. And so an exposure factor, really, we need to think about how thick the body part is, how dense the body part is. So can we give 150 kV and 1 MAS for everyone? Well, no, because it's just not the amount of rays there to adequately penetrate the image. You need more rays. So there's an illustrative diagram of the effect of filament current, which is a filament, it's MAS. And I am just talking about it as current at the moment, because really it's MAS, which is milliamp seconds. Now, milliamps are a measure of amperes, which is one joule per Coulomb. Don't need to worry about that too much. It's just an equivalent of energy. And so the less MAS you've got, the less photons you've got. Simple as, really. But I want you to think about what impact that has, 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 has on the number of rays, basically. So Less MS means less radiation. Less of it's going to pass through. More of it may be attenuated depending on the current, uh, depending on the KV. And less is going to reach the image receptor. And so you're going to get a poor signal to noise ratio. Whereas you have more MAS, more radiation reaches the receptor. That's the theory anyway. So looking at these two images, we're looking purely at MA. What can you tell me about image A and what can you tell me about image B? Well, image A is underpenetrated. And again, I've used this term penetrated uh, in the first image that we talked about with the chest x ray in terms of KB, but we're looking purely at the effect of current, um, the MAS, on an image. So image A, is it a femur? Well, we know it's a neck of femur or a hip. What can you tell me about the acetabulum? What can you tell me about the neck of femur? There's a lot of detail. It's not penetrated. There are not enough rays there to tell you to tell you what's going on. There's not enough rays that's hit that detector to give me sufficient diagnostic information as to what's happening with that femoral head. And so... It, there's just not enough radiation there to penetrate it. It's all about penetration with radiographers. Just can't get enough of it. So we'll go back to B, image B. What can you tell me about image B? If I told you that that was, if the first image was, let's say, 70 kV, 1 MAS. So you've got energetic rays. But you've not got any, you've not really got many of them. You're not going to penetrate the image. If I told you that image B was 75 or 70 kV and 150 MAS, a ridiculously high MAS for a hip. And so fine, you've got the adequate penetrating uh, energetic X rays, but you've just dumped 
a lot of x-rays through there, and you're just blocking the image. So current is basically the number of rays and the amount of radiation. Now, we talk about contrast density and sharpness when we're performing an image evaluation. And we expect you to be telling us, how do you know that it's adequately penetrated? How do you know that you've got current, good contrast density and sharpness? And it relates back to KV and MA. So KV produces contrast. MA produces density. The blackness of a film is what it can be thought of as. As you can see, an absolute shed load of rays have hit that plate. And just black the film. You have got a little bit of detail. There's been a little bit of attenuation. But because there's that many rays, it's just blackened the film. The other one's got sort of foggy. And now we're looking at sort of more of the other end of the spectrum. So A is an adequately penetrated film, given an appropriate exposure factor, 75 and 12. B is underexposed. You're missing the bony detail from the femoral head. And these have all been given the same KV, however the MAS has been varied. So image A is 70 and 16. B is 70 and 4. And C is 70 and 40. And as you can see, you've got a loss of bony detail. So you can't differentiate between, you can differentiate between air and bone. You can't really differentiate between air and soft tissue. There's no soft tissue definition because you've lost it because you fired that many rays at it that it's just black in the film. So we have S. What does S mean? S relates to time, MAS, in seconds or milliseconds. It's more in milliseconds for us. Milliseconds is a thousandth of a second. And it's very, very quick, but I tell you now that when you set uh, manual exposures as I do, uh, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, we're going to have a look. Well, saying that, we're working milliseconds, don't we? And it seems really, really fast, and, boop, and that's it. X-rays taken. And the lab have postponed their time travel experiment to last week. So what do we mean by MAS? How does MAS affect our images? It's time, really. And all that means is the time that the the time that the um come on. The time that the filament is heated up for, and the time that the X-rays are accelerated across the tube for. That's all it is. So it's basically leaving the light bulb on for longer. Turn the big light off. And that's that's all it is. It's basically how long the tube's on for in milliseconds. And we usually use it as a product of current over time. And so it will give, say, 200 MAS is 200. Uh, well, it depends on the time that you want the tube active for. And so if you want the tube active for, say... Let's say two seconds, but you still want to give 200, uh, but you don't want to give 200 MAS or uh, 2000 MAS because, um, no. Let's backtrack. Boop. So S stands in MAS, stands for the how long the tube's on for. And it's a product of current over time. So it's how long the filament is heated for over a time in milliseconds. However, we can adjust that. Now, if you have a really high MAS, you mean, say, 40, 60, 80 MAS, that means that your tube's on for a longer amount of time, and that can lead to something called motion and sharpness. That's an undesirable effect of MAS all the time. It's an undesirable effect of time. Also, aging is quite undesirable too. And it didn't seem like five minutes ago since I qualified. <laughs> and so that's where patients have moved. How do we, how can we combat that? Simply make them sit still. Can't, not always the case. Not always the case. You know, it would be wonderful if we could sedate, knock out every single non-compliant patient that we had. 
from the drunk 30-year-old in A&E that's passed out and fallen down a staircase and has now hurt their head and you're having to head and neck and you're having to x-ray the cervical spine whilst they're trying to get off the trolley and they potentially have a neck injury. And then, you know, or you're trying to do the lumbar spine and try and get up. So you've got a loss of sharpness. This is called motion on sharpness, blurriness. Can you tell there's a fracture there or can you tell if there's a subtle fracture? Well, no, not really. Because the patient's moved and blurred the image because you're giving x-rays over a long period of time, a product of current over time. And as you move, as it's receiving the data, it keeps on receiving it, even though the body parts moved out of the way. And so it produces these blurry images. Now, I alluded earlier on how can we put this to good use? You know, what? How, how can we put what to good use? Nobody wants any patients moving. Well, there are certain circumstances whereby we might want that movement. We might be able to use that movement to our advantage, the, the clever rascals that we are. Um, how? how what, in what circumstance would you maybe think that using a movement and sharpness would be advantageous. Anybody? Well, think about structures that are naturally moving. So you've got the heart and the lungs. They're naturally moving all the time. If they start moving, people tend to get worried. And so if you're looking at bony structures that don't move, we can blur the structures that we don't want to see out. And I'll show you an example of that, one of my favourite examples actually, of looking at the thoracic spine. Can anyone tell me what's gone on here? And I've put the exposure factors up to show you that we've not really changed the exposure factors much, but what have we changed? So the first picture was taken uh, a tenth of a second. So everything's in focus. You've got lovely lung markings. It looks like this person has probably got a, a bit of pulmonary edema going off. Don't quote me on that. But you can see their lung markings very, very nicely overlying the lovely bony detail of the thoracic spine. What bony detail, to be fair? I, that, I can't really tell if they... I couldn't tell if they've got a, a fracture somewhere. You can see there's a bit of a problem there. Well, what's going on? You can see the cervicothoracic junction and the upper cervical vertebra. Uh, but no, no. On the left-hand image, it's given at 75 kvp and 32 mas. Yeah, no chance. Now, on the other hand, this, this is the same person. They're just poorly positioned each time. And that shows the vertebral bodies in the thoracic spine a lot better. Can you tell me what's happened? Well, as a person continues to breathe, the lungs and the heart move. And so that motion causes them to blur, so they're out of focus. And the vertebral bodies don't tend to move that much when you breathe. But the ribs move, the lungs move, the heart moves. As you're breathing in and out, you can get a patient to breathe in. And slowly breathe out. I used to take these exposures over uh, 1,600 milliseconds, and I would still give about 36 MAS, between about 36 and 42 MAS. In the days of DR now, our DR cassettes can only go up to 612 milliseconds. Very oddly specific value. And so there are the things, those are some of my favourite things. No. And so that's one way we can use motion and sharpness to our advantage. So what else affects our exposures? So now we've covered KV. So we know that KV is the penetrating power of an X-ray or of an X-ray uh, photon or an X-ray exposure. It's the penetrating power of an X-ray exposure. Or the quality, so the KV is the quality of the beam, how, energ how energetic the beam is. The time is over the, is the period of time that the patient is exposed for or that the beam is on for. And the MAS is the, a product of current over time. So the total MAS 
is 36. It's a little bit higher than the, the other side for reasons that I won't go into right now. But if you set them both manually on an X-ray tube, I'll assure you that you'll get 32 on one side and 36 on the other. You can't go below that because you'll get about 27 if you change it in between. I won't go into that exact relationship just yet. So what else? SID, not SDD. That was a typo. Not SID from Ice Age. But he's here to brighten your day if you just had four lectures on physics. And this is probably one of the most important that we've drilled into, and it's the inverse square law. People are, oh, physics, and they see this, and they immediately fall asleep and switch off, sort of kind of thing. But it's very important. And one of the important principles of it is all that it says, 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 the inverse square law, is that for every unit of distance, so we've got S, which is our point X-ray source, our theoretical point source, even though... Um, it's impossible to get an infinitesimally small origin of x-rays. So we've got S, which is our x-ray source. And then we move one meter away. And at one meter, if we give 75 and 4 MAS. So at one, that's, that's what it'll be at one. at one unit of distance. And then if we move to two units of distance, so we move it at two meters, what, how many rays are we going to get? Is it half? No, it's a quarter. And basically, people get hung up on the inverse square law because it looks very scientific and all these divisions and various bits and bobs. That's just another way to iterate exactly what it means. So you've got relative beam intensity on the scale of 0 0.1 to 1, 1 being maximum intensity, 0 0.1 being the lowest intensity. So 1 is the most intense. So obviously if you stuck your eyeball or your face in front of the X-ray machine, even though there is an inherent distance, we can assume for all intents and purposes that it will be maximum intensity. If you move a metre away, it's a quarter of that. If you move two metres away, it's a ninth. If you move four meters away, it's a sixteenth of what it would be, a twenty-fifth, a thirty-sixth, a forty-ninth, sixty-fourth, an eighty-first, and one hundredth if you're ten meters away. And that's all that means. Now, how does that relate to imaging somebody? Well, PA chest X rays for one, using um, so if you increase your distance from your patient, sometimes you might need to, you, you might need to increase your distance for, um, to reduce motion, uh, not motion and sharpness, geometric and sharpness. Geometric and sharpness is the apparent magnification of an object, um, with in increasing proximity to an X-ray source. Very simple principle. If I shine a torch at something and put my hand in front of it, my hand appears massive. It's not. It's really not massive. Well, it might be. And so you need, ideally, you want to have your object as cl physically close as possible to your X-ray receptor. You want to have the tube as far away as possible uh, to reduce geometric and sharpness, but not a ridiculous distance that you don't have enough X-rays to actually produce an image. And so it's a relationship between all those four things. And so we've gone through all that, so I'm going to do a quick recap. So we were talking earlier about exposure factors, and hopefully now we're going to move on to the bones of the body. It's not an anatomy class, it's about, I'm going to give you a strategy for selecting exposure factors, We'll give a little bit of a disclaimer. When you go out on placement, the exposure factors may be completely different to what I quote, and it's likely they will be. And I'm not saying I'm a liar. That is because they have predetermined those exposure factors based on QA. I'm not going to go into that just yet. 
but they predetermined their optimal exposure factors or their rough optimal exposure factors. But this rule can be applied to any department, except where you have certain situations, certain exceptions, which we'll talk about later. And so what are... Well, there are 206 bones in the body. We don't x-ray all 206 bones. That's called the CT scan. No, it's not. <laughs> so how do you remember all these exposure factors? You might see me... Um, I'll tell you a story. I don't know if any of you have been on my placement yet or whether you... Are you just about to go on placement? Okay. So if any of you have not been out on placement yet or have been out on placement, you might see radiographers picking exposure factors or tapping a hand and then doing a pelvis x-ray on a child. Hmm. What's going on here? Doesn't matter. It actually doesn't matter. On X-ray control panels, for our convenience, that's literally all they're for, it, they have an anatomical selector. So it can pick hand, wrist, elbow, foot, forearm. And the reason the anatomical selector is there is to allow us to easily select. It's more for our convenience, really, because if we pick a pelvis X-ray, we will want to use, likely in, adult, in an adult, we want to use our bookie, which is a tray underneath an x-ray table with a moving grid above it and two AEC chambers. Don't need to worry about those too much just yet. This will all come with time, not related to MIS. Anyway, it might seem like magic when we're changing exposure factors, but I had a student comment on how that I picked hand when I x-rayed a baby's pelvis. I didn't actually use the settings that I used for a hand. I went up a little bit. But then after I did that, I did a pelvis. I did an adult pelvis in the bookie, in the bookie tray, and didn't come off of hand. I'd manually selected the exposure chambers, the automatic exposure chambers, AECs or AED automatic exposure detector. And I'd gone up on my Kvian MAS because I knew that the thickness and size of the body part had changed. So those there are purely for our convenience. Really on older X-ray machines, we just had KV, MA, or KV, M, and MAS. Uh, modern sort of machines that we have do allow you to change MA, uh, KV, MA, and S manually. I really like doing that on particularly thoracic spines. I'll just take you back to those wonderful images there. And using that principle of in, uh, the principle of time to be able to allow us to blur out objects that are moving. Anyway, now let's move on to the important bit, the strategy for exposure factors. So how do we, we're going to play a little game. I want you to get in groups of four and you don't have to do this at home. If you do, then you probably will not have a fun time if you're hung drawn and quartered into four bits. And so we're going to do play your exposure right. Play your exposures right. And using the principles of density, so thinking about how thick a body part is, what kind of body part it is, I personally use this method to remember all of my exposure factors. And I actually tested myself uh, with the students uh, to prove that my method works. Your mileage may vary. But if you know these, what I call prime factors, nothing to do with prime numbers at all. I've just made that up on the spot. If you can figure out or know the rough exposures in any department for a hand, a chest, a cervical spine, and a pelvis, 
you can determine any exposure factor. Any. Absolutely any. In most cases. Terms and conditions apply. So, in your groups again, I want you to think about, thinking about talk, where I was talking about the thickness of a body part, the density of a body part. So remember, something can be thick but not always dense. I know some people can be dense. And whether it's going to be moving. Now you may be wondering why. So I'll let you do that for a couple of minutes and we'll come back. And we're back. You've got you thinking about how thick something is, how dense something is. We're going to, I'm going to give you some rough exposure factors that I use Again, within my department, but these, this can apply to any department, because if you find out what your de facto or default exposure factors are in your department for each of these body parts, then you can figure out exactly what exposure factors you should give, or your rough exposure factors. So a hand, 60 and 1. I would personally argue, I don't know if the... Uh, the evidence has changed. I would personally argue that you should never go below 60 kV. Maybe different with different manufacturers. Personally, I'm of the uh, of the knowledge at the moment, at least, that below 60 kV, you're going to increase skin surface dose massively. Why? Linking back to the energy of the X-ray photons, it means that they can't penetrate things. They can't get through. And so what are they going to do? They're going to be absorbed. They're going to be attenuated, they're absorbed into the body. So they're not going to hit the image receptor. They're going to land inside you, which you don't really want them to do, ideally. You want them to pass through, be attenuated as they pass through and form an image. So 60 and 1 is about the lowest I will go for most exposure factors. PA chest, 85 and 3.2 for an average man. Why? But why? Well, the chest is quite a dense structure. It's not that dense, actually. You've got your heart, your lungs, your mediastinum, which is a combination of the heart and the great vessels, which is your pulmonary arteries, your aorta. So that's quite dense. You've got your lungs, which are not so dense. And you've got ribs, which are quite dense bone, but they're quite thin. They're, they're not really big bones like your skull. And so, with a PA chest, you don't really need too much current. You don't need many rays. You need high energy rays to get through. And you need not so many in terms of volume or quantity. Because you need that contrast that 85 kVp is going to allow it to penetrate and see all those structures, but there's not that much there. There's lots of air in the lungs. There's dense muscular tissue or breast tissue if you're a woman and have big boobs. Um, there's dense tissues. There's air. There's air soft tissue. Again, we're going back to the primary radiographic densities, air soft tissue and bone. So you want to be able to differentiate between all those, but you want to adequately penetrate the heart, you want to adequately penetrate the lungs, you want to adequately penetrate or just adequately penetrate the spine so you can see the vertebral bodies behind the heart. And so you're getting an overall picture of the chest. And you also want soft tissue borders. So that's why I select those exposure factors for a chest. Bear in mind, these are CR, computed radiography exposures. Digital exposures just pretty much just throw all this out of the window. Well, they don't. They use similar principles to that, but they have uh, very, very fancy software and very fancy technology, which I'll go through in another lecture if I'm ever invited back. Pelvis. Now, can you see what I've done there? And I've not deliberately done this. This the These are the preset exposure factors uh, at Barnsley, I think, though we've moved to DR now, though the MAS is significantly lower. However, these are the preset exposure factors on our mobile machines on CR. 
Can you see what's happened? I've times the MA by 10 for a pelvis, a gridded pelvis. So in terms of thickness and density, well, it's much, it's not that much thicker. It depends on how big your belly sticks out, I suppose. But your pelvis, in terms of density, you have big bony structures. You've got two left and right hemi. You've got your left and right hemi pelvis made up by the ilium and the sacroiliac joints, which connect your lumb your lumbar spine to your pelvis. These are big, dense bony structures. And when I was talking about density, you need a lot of rays to get through it. And you also need a lot of energy to get through it because they're dense. They're big, they're dense. The more dense something is, you need adequate energy to penetrate it. But you also need adequate number of rays to get through it as well. Because if you give, you know, 85 kVp and 3.2 MAS, you're probably not going to get a very good picture. Because there aren't just there aren't enough rays to get through. Because it's that dense, there aren't enough rays to get through it. Whereas if you give 32 MAS, you've got plenty of rays to get through it. You've got plenty of X-ray photon energy, and you've got plenty of photons to make that trip through. Because because it's so dense, the reason why you need lots of rays is because one, you're going to get um, a lot of scatter, internal scatter. You're going to get a lot of attenuation and absorption by those big bony structures. And lateral cervical spine, 75 kVp and 60 nmas. So your cervical spine, nowhere near as thick or as dense, depending on if you're a rugby player, as your pelvis. It's quite thin. You've got some air-filled structures. You've got the trachea, the esophagus. Sound a bit like uh, someone. Uh, UK politician. And so you've got, again, back to your radiographic densities, you've got the cervical vertebrae. You've got the trachea. You've got the, which is an air-filled structure. You've got the soft tissues anteriorly and posteriorly to the cervical spine. Now, you might be wondering, why has Steve picked these densities? Now, pick, pick these particular body parts. Now, normally I would have just said C-spine, lateral cervical spine, chest and pelvis. Now, can anyone see the significance of the lateral cervical spine, chest and pelvis and hand? Well, these are sort of the upper, these are the, what I call prime exposure. And back in the days of CR, you were required no longer to do something called a trauma series. You don't need to worry about a trauma series. I don't ever expect you to be doing one now. Um, I've done about three PAPs uh, in my entire career and saw two as a student because that was, m we're moving towards CT scans now and Camp Bastion Protocol. And so what I've really done there is set upper and lower thresholds as to the maximum and minimum X-ray exposure factors I should use. And so thinking about in terms of density, in terms of thickness, and what structures are inside the body that we're imaging, you can use these, you can use these four exposures to think, is it higher or is it lower than what I've picked, uh, than, than what's being x-rayed. So I've already given you an exposure factor for lateral cervical spine. What about AP? It's about half. 75 kV and 8 MAS for an AP. With or without a grid. Got to consider thyroid dose, though, and how big the patient is, how thick their neck is. What about an AP thoracic spine? Well, let's go back to our prime factors. So, we've got... But we're looking at the bony structures within the chest. So it's similar. You might think it's similar to a chest X-ray. So are the exposure factors for a thoracic spine going to be higher or lower than a pelvis? Now we're thinking about in terms of MAS and KVP. 
So, do you need 85 kV for a thoracic spine? I would say no. You're just looking at the bones, really. So, we probably want about 75 kV. So it's more in terms of the density of a cervical spine. Is it as dense as a pelvis? Yes. There's lots of bones in there. We're looking at the bones, the 12 thoracic vertebrae. And so really, we want to just penetrate the bone and the bone only. So we need a lot more rays compared to a chest x-ray. So I would say about 75 and 40 for a thoracic spine. Between 32 and 40. Remember, these aren't exact, but I'm just trying to give you a strategy to, in order to help you determine the exposure factors until you gain some experience. So your first day on placement, I want you to go out and find out what those are. And I want you to be trying to figure out a rough exposure factor that you would give for certain body parts. What about a lateral thoracic? I've already given you them. Lateral thoracic. Remember, average person. Probably not. What about a lumbar spine. About the same as a pelvis. 85 and 40 for a lumbar spine. And again, I'm using this idea of upper and lower thresholds. Is it going to be higher or lower? That's why I'm playing are Steve's exposure factors right? So if you had no anatomical selector, you could think, well, is it higher or lower than a chest? Or is it higher or lower than a hand? Pretty sure you're not going to give 60 and 1 for a lumbar spine. Okay, so the next highest up, is it a higher or lower than a chest? Well, the KVP is about right, but the MAS is a bit off. So we've now established a reasonable KVP level. What about pelvis? Uh, what about MAS? So is the MAS more towards a pelvis or is it more towards a cervical spine? It's more towards a pelvis. So now we've got our upper threshold for a reasonable exposure factor. Probably about 85 and 40. Again, dependent on the patient. I'm saying there's no exact ro exacting way to do it. There is a way to develop um, optimal exposure factors using QA processes and phantoms, but we won't go into that. AP pelvis. Oh, how convenient is that? What about horizontal beam hip? Let's put that. Let's put that there. So we've got our upper and minimum and maximum thresholds in terms of X-rays. Now, horizontal beam hip, very, very thick, very, very dense. Lots of soft, dense, soft tissues. And we've got really thick, soft tissues. We've got thick cortical bone in the femur. Femur is very strong. So in terms of upper and lower threshold, is it more towards a hand? Absolutely not. If you give 60 in one, you'll probably see nothing but soft tissue. Is it more towards a chest? Certainly the KV is. What about the MAS? The MAS is certainly not close towards a chest. Is the MAS close to a cervical spine? Is the thickness the same as a cervical spine? Well, my thigh is probably about the same thickness as my neck. But again, dense muscular structures within the thigh. Really not as dense as my neck. Even though it might be as thick as my neck, my thigh, even though it probably is a little bit bigger, it's going to be much more than that. So, it's not a cervical spine. The MAS is not sim close to a cervical spine. What about pelvis? So, I've already done the AP pelvis at 85 kVp and 32 MAS. And we're on the horizontal beam. Again, we've got Big dense structure to get through. We've got an x ray grid, which um, is designed to review scatter because you're going to get a lot of internal scatter 
when you do this x-ray. And so, is it higher or lower than a pelvis? It's higher. You might think it's lower, it's higher. Play your cards right, play your exposures right, it's higher. On average, with even with our DR system, about 80 and 80, or 85 and 80 kV. Uh, 85 MAS, 85 KVP and 80 MAS. And that's because, one, you need the rays to get through the dense structure. Because it's dense, those rays are going to be attenuated and are going to be absorbed. So you need high KVP, high energy X-rays. You need lots of them to get through the dense structures because they're going to attenuate them more. And you're going to get a lot of scatter. And so you use a grid. A grid increases your exposure factors. You have to give a greater exposure factor because your grid inherently stops some of the primary beam radiation as well as scatter. It doesn't stop all of the scatter. Well, it's designed to stop scatter, but it will also stop some of the primary beam. Not all, I would hope. Otherwise, you wouldn't see anything. Although an incorrect use of a grid will result in grid lines. So we've done HBL hip 80 and 80, 85 and 80, AP and lateral knee. Let's have a look at that. So upper and lower threshold, 60 kVp and 1 MAS. 60 kVp? Sounds about right for a knee. It's a little bit higher, actually. It's about 15, 55% higher, about 65 kV. So if we're looking at hand, is it towards a hand or a lateral cervical spine? It's in between cervical spine and hand. It's not quite 70. It's about 65. In terms of MAS, think about the structure. It's the distal portion of the femur. Is it more towards a lateral cervical spine with a grid, or is it more towards a chest? So I want you to write this down. It's actually more towards the chest, and about average, we'll give 65, between 65 and 2.5 and 3.6, 3.2, 3.6 MAS. So that's your AP and lateral knee. So foot, six, I'm going to quickly go through these. A foot is a little bit more dense, lots of bones, about 27 bones-ish uh, in the foot. Could be wrong, I think that might be hand. Foot is 60 and 2, ankle is 65 and 2.5, hand is 60 and 1, wrist is 60 and 2, elbow is 60 and 2. Fair, easy enough. There we go. And so hopefully going through that has given you a, sort of a real world strategy. Hopefully I've explained it well enough. If not, I will do a follow up video and talk to this. So you're able to go out on placement, hopefully, and have some rough idea of determining exposure factors. So when you go out on placement, I want you to go out and think, Oh, what exposure factors would I give for any? What exposure factors would I give for a shoulder? What exposure factors would I give for this? No. Find out your prime exposure factors, your lateral cervical spine with a grid, pelvis, AP pelvis with a grid, and uh, so you've got hand, you've got a PA chest, you've got a pelvis and a lateral cervical spine. You've got your four exposure factors that you can work from and think about in terms of density, in terms of thickness, in terms of sharpness, in terms of contrast. Sorry, that doesn't really make much sense. So you can think about, based on what you're imaging, you've got your upper and lower thresholds. Is it higher than a pelvis? Is it lower than a pelvis? Is it more towards a hand or is it more towards a wrist? So you've got your upper and lower thresholds and you can think, does my body part fall between them? And so if somebody is bigger than what you would deem your average patient, you can increase your exposure or you can decrease your exposure. And hopefully I've given you the tools to go out and be a little bit more confident in setting your exposure factors. Any questions? Obviously people on YouTube can't ask me questions directly, but ask in the video description.